Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from York Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth and once again yes in collaboration with Tom Fress from Inquisition Update all over the big pond as we say over here in Europe where he somewhere sits in the United States nobody needs to know where nobody needs to know why well why because he's born there born and raised American as I'm born and raised German and uh, we have something in common uh, Merry Americans were Protestants Many Germans were Protestants. Tom is shouting it from the rooftops in the United States of America that everybody should come out of ecumenism and come out of the Roman Catholic Church and come out of every church because every church in this world is corrupted and doesn't teach the truth of the Bible. And I in Germany or here in Belgium say the same thing. That's why we regularly come together and come from one subject to another. One thing leads to another. It's how this world runs it all you know everybody says all roads lead to rome and i'm not speaking about the book of michael de Semnian that as tom well as as i read and uh, that's not the point by the way an interesting book if you haven't read it uh, you should get it or if you didn't listen to it listen to my or tom's recording of that book reading all roads lead to rome that's true because every little detail in this world is necessary to finally build a new tower of babel and the new Tower of Babel, or Babylon, is the New World Order. Which is no new, not new, because you know, there was already a Tower of Babel, thousands of years ago. And they are just rebuilding that whole abomination all over again. And we want to throw, how does Tom always say this? Monkey wrenches in their way. <laughs> Come here and there and tell people a little bit of truth to wake up and books like the one from P.D. Stewart that we are um, reading right for the moment now help us a little bit with that. Um, we started reading this uh, wonderful chapter, Evangelicals and Catholics Together. Um, the dog returns to his vomit and we are now on page 452 going to continue this. And this has to do not only with the New World Order, this has to do not only with the ecumenism it has to do also of course with the roman catholic socialist agenda which is the overall subject i thought i put all this into and as you can see as we are going to continue in this book also this is one of the roads that leads to rome but now after my very long introduction finally let's open the mic to brother tom hello tom and welcome to the broadcast Hello, Yerk. It's nice to be here as always. And uh, I just want to tell the listeners how uh, adept your comments were when you said uh, you equated uh, the New World Order with the uh, a, a new uh, Tower of Babel. There's a lot of wisdom and knowledge and understanding in that statement. And uh, I would expect that kind of uh, comment from you who has understanding and wisdom on this subject. And uh, it's, it's literally what it is, a recreation of the, the, the unity of all the people against the God of heaven, the God of creation. It literally is a new Tower of Babel. That's what this, this uh, new world order is. And the new world order Nimrod is the papacy. And you've heard me say, if you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update, uh, I call the Pope the global Nimrod, and uh, he is what he is, and he can't help what he is. Uh, he was destined for this uh, this uh, condemnation, and he's in the world. He's been in the world ever since the first Pope, and uh, we, we don't believe in a future Antichrist. We believe in a historical Antichrist, the one all the Protestants and all the believers of history believe. Uh, knew about and condemned. That's why they were martyred. And uh, of course, they've all been martyred. They're long since gone. And they've long since been forgotten in the so-called Protestant and evangelical world. The righteous perished and no one takes it to heart. But they all died because they pinned the tale of Antichrist on the papacy. They believed it. They taught it. And they... Uh, they acted upon it, and because they did, the papacy and the kings of the earth 
over which he ruled, hunted them down like dogs and killed them. And uh, and nothing is going to change until Christ returns. You want to be hated in this world? You just tell the truth about the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, the papacy, the modern-day Nimrod in this global Tower of Babel that they're building called the New World Order. So a uh, lot of wisdom, and I very much appreciate any time I hear somebody with their own mouth, using their own words, tell such a wonderful truth back to you. Yeah, those weren't my words, Tom. Those were the words the Holy Spirit gave me because I don't have that understanding by myself. It is by the grace of the Lord that I was born again and was since ever that moment led by the Spirit of God that leads me into all truth, not only by reading the Bible, but also by getting understanding of that. So I would never equate that to me myself. I'm just a stupid old man. <laughs> as you, you always say of yourself, I'm just a stupid old man, just a little older than me, but at least as stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's the spirit it's the spirit Tom, that leads us to do this um it's going to be interesting to start on page 452 of uh, of this book cold word babylon that uh, we are going to read here cold word babylon part two of course um as it says uh, antichrist is a woman alive and well again this is book two as you can see here in small writ uh, book one is uh, 666 danger in the vatican the sons of loyola and their plans for world denomination all of a sudden since weeks already tom i know this title by heart <laughs> I had so much trouble earlier and now it comes like it's written here in front of me <laughs> no, that was cited <laughs> thanks again to the holy spirit for leading into all truth um, we are reading this book now, and um, there are a few points that I disagree with the author with, and um, that is only because Tom and I had a very, very intensive study for the last a little bit more than two years on certain subjects. And I know we, we announced that already earlier, and um, but it's going to come in the future, believe me, uh, just trust us, and uh, <laughs> yeah, let's see when the Holy Spirit tells us this is the moment you gotta go, because we always wait on his go to go with things like that. Um, and you will see that while, when I'm reading this, I have to comment here, because here the author is wrong, because he just repeats a statement that is repeated so many times in the world. but. Again, okay, let, let's see what's it all about. Uh, page 452, the first full paragraph, that's where we last time uh, ended, because I, I could repeat what Chuck Colson said, um, the quote that ends two sentences before uh, this uh, full paragraph. But uh, you can read that for yourself. It's still in the same subject. It's of the ecumenism, and it is about people who are really telling Protestants to come back to mama. So Robert Schuler said, quote, it's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd, meaning the gospel, and say, what do we have to do to come home? Uh, uh, correction, uh, the, the shepherd he's referring to here the pope. is not the gospel, no, it's no. the pope. Uh, I, okay. I, I read something wrong here. Absolutely, Tom, you're okay. absolutely correct. Yeah, I don't know. what I, I had this this afternoon also, too. I read the word and I totally said something else. So again, <laughs> <laughs> and Robert Schuler said, quote, it's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd, between brackets, the Pope, and comment of me and Tom, the biblical, historical and prophetic Antichrist, and say, quote, what do we have to do to come home? Unquote. How true that prophecy in Revelation 13.3, which says the deadly wound would be healed. Indeed, confirming the fulfillment of this prophecy, Dominus Jesus, issued on September 5, 2005 by the Vatican Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, under the then Cardinal Ratzinger, now Pope Benedict XVI, admitted, quote, the lack of unity among Christians is certainly a wound for the Catholic Church." Unquote. Now, what's the comment that I have in this regard? Here, the wound that is afflicted to the first beast and seemed deadly in Revelation chapter 13 is equated to the schism of Protestantism. Now, let me assure you one thing, and that's the point where I have this problem with the author and probably 
yeah, <laughs> Tom too, because we study differently. We understand the Bible as it is written, and this doesn't say it. It's a a way to interpret it, but it's not the correct way. It's a way to interpret. You can use that, but don't make it a dogma. There have been two schisms in the Roman Catholic Church, two main schisms. The first one was in the 11th century, mid of the 11th century, I think 1054, when the Eastern Church broke away from the Western Roman Catholic Church. And ever since, it is called the Eastern Orthodox Church, or the Greek Orthodox Church, Russian Orthodox Church, whatever. And Orthodox means the original one. So, And many people forget when they speak about that church that it still is a Catholic Church. That's what they all have in common. They're all Catholic. Whether Western, Roman, or Eastern, Constantinopolitan, or Greek, or Russian, whatever. That's the first schism. And the second schism then came in the beginning of the 16th century with the real starting of the Reformation with the breaking away of many countries in Europe from the yoke of Rome. When the Reformation took place, when Protestantism was on its high form, and the Roman papacy thought we really have to do something against it, formed the Jesuit order, which called for the Council of Trent, which pronounced 125 anathemas against Protestantism that are still all valid today. They all have been re uh, how do you say that? Uh, not only repeated, but they have been uh, confirmed in the Second Vatican Council of the 1960s, so some 60 years ago. Uh, that's what they call then the Second Schism, yeah? when all these people came out of the Roman Catholic Church and founded their own church. All of a sudden you had Lutheran Church, Calvinist Church, Baptist Church, um, you name them. Uh, I mean, if you can, I don't know how many denominations there are today, but more than you have fingers on your hands. So um, all this was a result of a quote-unquote second schism. But that is not the wound of Revelation 13. The wound of Revelation 13 is much more important. And we will do that, as I already announced, we will do that in a deep study to tell you that. But the point is, the, uh, the problem is something that most people don't even see. They just don't read Revelation chapter 13 correctly. And everywhere in the world it is taught, oh, Rome, Rome fell. And there are even people who wrote her old books about that. Or should I say encyclopedias about that. The fall of Rome by Gibbons, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And all this, a little bit of this, a little bit of that all going against the Bible. Because Daniel very made it very clear when he said, and he said that because he was given the information by an angel, by God through a messenger, which an angel is, he was told, from now on there will be four nations, four Gentile empires, <laughs> Whatever what you want to use. <laughs> yeah, we just had a discussion about this person who made a comment on the word goy or uh, Gentile in the Bible. Anyway, uh, there will be four empires in this world before the end of the world, before Jesus Christ comes back. He hasn't even come the first time at that moment. And those are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece and Rome. So what are you doing when you say Rome has fallen? You deny the word of God. You deny true biblical prophecy. Rome has not fallen. Rome is still here. It just took on another face. Alive and well again. Alive and well again, Tom. Absolutely. Of course you can apply this wound to other history facts. And the most popular in this world, and Tom knows that as much as I do, because Tom and I, we also talked about this, and we also taught about this before we got our real understanding. That with the falling in of Napoleon in Rome in the end of the, of the 18th century, and this General Berthier taking the Pope captive for a few years, where he died in captivity, and Blah, blah, blah. Oh, that was a wound. And then, of course, you have this, <laughs> you have this <laughs> newspaper. <laughs> Let's see if I can found that, find, find that picture. That's going to be interesting. Uh, deadly wound. Oh, no, it's not. It's, okay. 
<laughs> um, this is just a picture of this, and this is a picture of now. Uh, okay, this is a nice picture of the Pope of Rome, but that's not it. That's not what I was looking for. Um, maybe it's under the word heel, or I I don't know. Uh, no, it's not. I I don't know where I have that. It's it's a newspaper article from February 1929, where it says the wound is healed. When they talk about uh, the wound that was afflicted by General Berthier, healed by Mussolini when he gave back the Pope or the Vatican, um, the state of a nation state kingdom and the Pope uh, King of the Vatican. And uh, that's when they say the wound was healed, 1929, with the Lateran Treaties. But that's a big, big misleading. What was the real wound? What was the real healing of the wound? Well, when I say and announce regularly that Tom and I will do a study on that or share with you what we learned in our study, it would be a little uh, presumptuous to just do this now in five minute comment here. But I can tell you, uh, it is very easy. Uh, Rome has never fallen. Rome has merged. No, Rome has not merged. Rome has changed. Rome has just put on another garment. And uh, it's the same as in 321 when you know when Constantine made quote unquote Christianity the state religion of pagan Rome at that time. It's the same thing at that moment Christianity didn't change into paganism. Uh, paganism didn't change into Christianity. It was just that uh, something was pulled over the eyes of people to see it all in a different way. Oh, you can you can still uh, worship your old pagan Roman gods, no problem. Just bring them in our church, we will consecrate them and we will name them Holy Christophorus and Holy St. Bernard and Holy this and Holy that. You just change a name, but uh, you don't change the God behind it. Yeah? Because all the Saints of the Roman Catholic Church, actually, at least in the beginning, they were all pagan gods coming from Greece, going over to Rome, read Babylon Mystery Religion, read uh, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. Uh, it's all in there. It's all proven. Um, you can get that. So by that, Rome just changed the mask. You know, have you ever been to a mask ball? Have you ever been doing on... Uh, <laughs> I hope not, but Halloween or see anybody do that. What is that? You put a mask on your face, but you are still the same person behind that mask, right? Well, Rome did just that. It just put on another mask, but it is still Rome behind that mask. It was so in 321. It was so in 476. It just changed the mask. And that's what's it all about. Rome seemed to have vanished, but did not. Because Revelation says so clearly, a wound that seemed deadly, that appeared deadly, but the wound was healed. If it was deadly, it doesn't heal. Because when you're dead, nothing heals anymore. Your body stops functioning completely. Same with the nation. But with Rome, it was healed. And what came out of it? And what was the further development? I'm not telling you right now, but I'm just telling you, when you read what the author says here, what Robert Schuller says, what we have to do? What have we to do? Uh, what do we have to do to come back home? How true is the prophecy in Revelation 13:3, 13, 13, which says the deadly wound would be healed? This is not it. It's another deception of that. You can almost call it futurism because it's something that plays in the future of the real event. Anyway, Tom, I don't know if you have anything to add or want anything to add of this, or shall I just continue reading? Well, I would just add that uh, Robert Schuller famously and publicly said it's time for Protestants to go back to the Pope. Yeah. It's, t it's time for Protestants to go back to the Roman Catholic Church. Now, now I'm going to tell you something about Robert Schuller that most people don't understand or don't. Uh, 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 no, Robert Schuller was a 33rd degree Freemason. And Freemasonry, uh, for those who don't know, is simply a way to pr uh, uh, enlist marginal Protestants and evangelical into a Jesuitical society. Okay? Freemasonry is 
a concordant order of the Jesuits. Okay, they the Freema Freemasonry is in concord with Jesuitism. In other words, Freemasonry is just Jesuitism for Protestants and Evangelicals. And they're enlisted to help Rome, to help destroy the Protestant Reformation, and to bring Protestants and Evangelicals back into the Roman Catholic Church. That's the goal of Freemasonry. And then there's multitudes of Freemasons that don't even have a clue of this. If they knew anything about Freemasonry, they would get out. And uh, uh, especially if they consider themselves to be Protestant, evangelical. It's high time for somebody to stand up publicly and inform Freemasons what they're really involved in. And, and one of the best examples is this example of Robert Schuller, 33rd degree Freemason, who said famously and publicly, it's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd, which to you and me is Christ, but to Robert Schuller, the shepherd is the Pope. Okay? And we're, he, Robert Schuller, the Freemason, that is the Protestant Jesuit, if you'll, if you'll allow that expression, because that's what Robert Schuller was, a Protestant Jesuit, saying to the Pope, what we, what must we do to come home? That's what Freemasonry is all about. I can't name you another commentator on, on these subjects that will tell you that. Freemasonry is a concordant order of the Jesuit order. Okay? The Jesuits long time ago infiltrated Freemasonry and have co-opted it. <clears throat> and... Uh, seem to be in opposition to Freemasonry when, in fact, they literally run Freemasonry. Yeah, that was in and the beginning of the 18th century, Tom. That was 1710, 1711, when they even wrote the uh, Scottish Rite levels all over. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, uh, many people would argue and contend with me on this, but Robert Schuller's spiritual brother was Billy Graham who also is believed very heavily to have been a 33rd degree Mason, a, a secret 33rd degree Freemason. It's even alluded to in one of the popular books that was circulating years ago, uh, exposing uh, Billy Graham of being a 33rd degree Freemason. He was actually seen at the tower, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, temple, the Masonic temple just on the, on the north side of the uh, White House, as I recall. And uh, Billy Graham and Robert Schuller were spiritual uh, brethren. They were Freemasons. In other words, they were Jesuits operating as, free as, uh, as Protestants and Evangelicals. Protestantism and Evangelicalism have been infiltrated by the Jesuits in, in Freemasonry. Freemasonry is just a pack mule of the Jesuits who brought futurism and ecumenism into the Protestant and evangelical churches. It's all part of, of the war that was declared against Protestantism in, in Vatican Count, or rather uh, the Council of Trent in the 1500s, 1560-65. It was an all-out war of annihilation. You've already alluded to it, Yerk, in your previous comments that the Council of Trent was a declaration of an all-out war of annihilation against Protestantism and evangelicalism and to, to, uh, uh, to heal the schism that took place at the time of Martin Luther. And uh, Billy Graham and Robert Schuller were both Freemasonic uh, uh, pack mules or, or uh, militants in that endeavor to destroy Protestantism and to reunite them back under the authority of the papacy. And of course, their master weapon of all to accomplish this goal was the teaching called futurism, where the Antichrist is not yet in the world, but it's a future single individual that comes just before Christ returns. Okay, the whole so-called Christian world 
is is waiting for the appearing of this so-called Antichrist, when in fact the papacy is the Antichrist, has been the Antichrist all throughout the Christian era. The Antichrist is the one who declared the all-out war of annihilation against Protestants in the 1500s. And the Antichrist is the one that rules and reigns over the Roman Catholic Church and always has. He's the one that ruled and reigned over the kings of, Earth, of, of the earth in, in Europe and, and eventually led to the Protestant Reformation because of the spiritual oppression. And uh, uh, he, the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And you're never going to understand history. You're never going to understand the Bible. You're never going to understand common sense or, or rather uh, current events unless you understand the papacy is the Antichrist. That's why we spend so much time talking about this. And uh, if you'll just wrap your brain around the fact that the papacy is the historical, the biblical, and prophetic Antichrist, then you have a chance of understanding the truth. You have an, a chance, finally, of understanding the, 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 the prophetic scriptures. You have an understanding of history and you can fairly well predict what's going to happen in the future. And uh, this new world order is simply a elevating the papacy to global dictatorship. Okay, you've heard your talk about caritas and veritate, papal encyclicals. It says there's no more such thing as private property. You hear Klaus Schwab saying, you will own nothing and you will be happy. He's just implementing papal dictatorship. He's implementing Roman Catholic social doctrine, which says the Pope owns the world and all that's in it, and he may do with it whatever he pleases. He may take from the rich, give to the poor, which means take from the Protestants and give to the, to the heathen. Okay, that's the truth. And your governments are the agents of the papacy implementing his new world order rules. He really, truly is the nimrod of our age and the global ecumenical uh, one world religion, one world economic system. It's not just by words. They're true things that are happening in the world. OK, they're tangible. They're visible. They're not even denying it anymore. And uh, it's in your face. It's on every channel. It's every headline. The new world order is a done deal. And uh, we're not even protesting. Because we don't believe the man of sin, the son of perdition, are even in the world yet. We're still looking, blindly as we are, for a future Antichrist when he's in our front room. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's in our front room and has been for centuries, 1,500 years. That's just how delusional the so-called Christian world is. And what is even more frustrating than all of that is that 500 years ago, Christians knew all this. If we knew today what we knew 500 years ago, at the time of the Protestant Reformation, there'd be no need for an Inquisition update. There'd be no need for a Tom Fress or a Yurt Glissman. Everybody knew what we're talking about. That's what caused the Protestant Reformation. They protested the Antichrist of Rome. And uh, now we have Freemasonry. You know, they've got, they've got a, a branch headquarters in every neighborhood in the world. Freemasonry is a global secret society. It's just, it's just Jesuitism for ignorant, uneducated, apostate Protestants and evangelicals. There I said it. That's what you are if you're a Freemason. You're an ingrate. You're a betrayer of Christ. You're a betrayer of the scriptures. You're a betrayer of the, of, the, of the Christian God. You're a betrayer of Jesus, the Messiah. If you're a member of Freemasonry, you serve a Vatican purpose. And you ought to abandon Freemasonry because your spiritual welfare depends upon it. 
Okay, I've said my piece about Freemasonry. I've been real quiet about Freemasonry for a long time because I've got a close family member that is a Freemason, and he needs to know the truth. And uh, he's not going to listen to me. I just hope he, and pray that he repents and comes out of Freemasonry before Christ returns. Back to you, Yerk. I think, Tom, that uh, one of the points that everybody, uh, one of the points that everybody underestimates, is um, when you speak about the Pope of Rome as the Antichrist, as this picture here on the screen says, is that people are always told anti means against. If everybody knew the true meaning of the word anti, and by that Antichrist being the substitute of Christ. There would be no doubt in anybody's mind that the papacy is, or the Pope of Rome is the Antichrist, because anti means not only against, that is just one of the definitions, first and for all it means in the place of. And the Pope clearly says he is the placeholder of Christ on earth, as long as Christ is in heaven, he warms his seat here on earth. If that was clear to everybody, <laughs> we could save 50% of our time teaching the Pope is the Antichrist because everybody understood, oh, it's the place in the place of Christ. And that's... Yeah, you, yeah, it's an excellent point you're making. It's one I should have made myself. It's one I should make every day. What the true meaning of the word Antichrist is, I couldn't say it better than you did. It's, it's the replacement of Christ. That's what Antichrist means. Anybody can look up the prefix A-N-T-I in a dictionary, and what they'll see with their own two eyes is the definition replacement of. Substitute of. Substitute for. Yeah. And uh, it, it's, it's it, you know, I, I blame our Protestant, our apostate Protestant evangelical uh, pastors Many of them Freemasons, by the way, who won't tell us these things. Yeah, but Tom, when they are when they are Freemasons, what are they really? Gate Jesuits. keepers. Gatekeepers. Yeah. They keep the gate of the Roman Catholic Church. They guard the door of the Roman Catholic Church. That's right. And they filter right. everybody who comes in there. That's right. That's their point. And when the whole world accepts this explanation, oh, anti means against, well, then you always wait for someone who comes up here and says that I am against Christ. The Pope will never openly state that he is against Christ. But as Jesus said, by their fruits, you will know them. And when you look at the fruits of the Pope now and of the Pope before and of every Pope ever since the papacy came into existence, when you measure them by their fruits, you know that he is against Christ, but also that he is the, in the place of what he calls Christ. Because the Pope actually is the vicar of Satan and not the vicar of Christ on earth. By their fruits, you will know them. By that, you know them. And by distracting that word, or giving this, this word has different meanings, and by always putting the emphasis on anti means against, 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 nobody ever questions himself, is that true? And opens, as Tom said, a dictionary and looks up the word anti, and that says, oh, replacement of, substitute for. Exactly. If people knew that, Tom and I would only do would only need to do fifty percent of our work, right? Now, to add to this, to wrap it all up for the listeners so they can perfectly understand this, there's no greater way to oppose Christ than to say that you've replaced him. Okay? There's no greater way to oppose Christ. There's no greater way to be, to be against Christ than to say to the world and insist that everyone believe that the Pope has replaced Christ. And that's why it's appropriate to call him Antichrist, because in the world, he insists that the whole world believes that he has replaced Christ. 
that he rules this world in the stead of Christ. And that's why the kings of the earth are required to obey him as if he were Christ on the earth. And that's how the new world order gets built. That's how the modern day Tower of Babel gets built because the kings and queens and princes and potentates and politicians and law enforcement and lawyers and doctors, they all agree we have to have a king of kings and a lord of lords, and that is, was, and always will be the papacy, because he sits in the place of Christ in this world. That's why the Protestants rebelled. They wished to serve Christ and him only. They realized that the papacy was the Antichrist. And they fled the Roman Catholic Church. And they protested the papacy. They protested the man of sin. They protested the Antichrist. And they educated the whole world about it, just like me and Yerk are doing today. And this all, all this information has been lost. It was common knowledge 500 years ago. You know, some people would like to elevate Yerk and I as being godsends or some kind of a, a prophet or some kind of a, a sage or, or somebody's bringing new information. No, it's not new at all. There's nothing special about Yerk and, and Tom Fress other than we're just telling the truth that was known 500 years ago. We're not looking for followers of ourselves. We're, we're not looking to be famous or anything. Just all we want to do is restore knowledge that was perfectly held among believers no more than 500 years no no more than 500 years ago. How could we be so ignorant in 500 years? Okay, you know, no one. You know, sometimes I get accused of trying to make myself out to be somebody. Well, that's baloney. I'm nobody. I'm like like Yerk said earlier. I'm just a stupid old man. It just happens to know the truth about certain things and has the courage to tell it. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, that has the courage to tell it. Look, everybody considers honesty a virtue. But nobody wants to hear the truth. An interesting quote. And by the way, I found the picture about the... Um, Ah, uh, letter and treaty. San Francisco Chronicle, February 11th, 1929. Mussolini and Cardinal Gaspari sign historic Roman pact. Quote, the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy. In affixing the autographs to the memorial document, healing the wound of many years, extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. Unquote. Here they teach you that the wound that has been inflicted by Napoleon in 1798 is now healed with the Lateran treaties of Mussolini and Cardinal Gaspari. That hey, is can, another... can I add something to this year? Can yeah, I sure, add something sure. to this? Now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church passed this off as the, the wound that was healed. Let me tell you something. Rome suffered a serious head wound at the time of the Protestant Reformation, did they not? When people sure. were fleeing the Roman Catholic Church in droves, whole states, I mean, half or more of Europe abandoned the papacy. They overthrew their papal kings and queens and potentates, and they installed their own republics. They changed their form of government entirely. And it looked to the world it looked for all the world like the days of the popes were over, that they'd finally overthrown the Antichrist tyrant of Europe. And it looked for all the world like the mortal wound had been inflicted upon the papacy. The Protestant Reformation was the most lethal threat to the papacy that it had experienced ever since the Orthodox Church separated back in the early mid millennial times all right but 
that deadly wound that was inflicted at the time of the Protestant Reformation was healed when in the early 1800s it began to be preached among Protestant evangelical seminaries and colleges and universities that the papacy is not the Antichrist, as we once thought. The Antichrist is a single individual that won't come until the end of time, just before Christ returns, so we can all breathe a sigh of relief. And as a matter of fact, maybe we ought to make reparations to the papacy since we robbed him of all of his power, we robbed him of all of his prestige, we robbed him of his lands, we robbed him of all that he valued at the time of the Protestant Reformation. We now admit that we were wrong. The papacy is not the Antichrist. It's a single individual that comes at the end of the time. So maybe we ought to ecumenically reunite with the Roman Catholic Church, just like Robert Schuller says, it's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd, that is the Pope, and say, what do we have to do to come home? We're sorry about the Protestant Reformation. We were blindly ignorant to the fact that the Antichrist is a single individual that doesn't come until just before Christ returns at the so-called 70th week of Daniel. And, and we owe the Roman Catholic Church so much because we inflicted so much pain and so much division and so much suffering. And we, we, we I mean, our spiritual lives depend upon returning and, and breaking peace and unity the unity of Christ, all join the Roman Catholic Church, all eat and drink damnation to ourselves by partaking in the Mass together. Let's all die together. Do I make my point? Oh, Have Tom. I made my point finally? That's what ecumenism is all about. That's what Freemason, 33rd degree Freemason Robert Schuller was all about. And that's what 33rd degree Freemason Billy Graham was all about. Destroying the Protestant Reformation and making restitution and reparations for the Protestant Reformation to the Antichrist of the Bible, the papacy. Our, our leaders, our Christian leaders in this world are totally apostate. They are not to be believed. They are not to be patronized. They are not to be supported. They are to be condemned and abandoned as liars. False shepherds. They've led the whole Christian world astray. They all share the blame for single-handedly destroying the Protestant Reformation by believing in the Jesuit delusion called futurism. That somehow the 70th week of Daniel was cut off of the 69th week, cast into the future by 2,000 or more years, and then won't be fulfilled by Jesus at all, but be, will, ref, will be ref, uh, fulfilled by the Antichrist. It's the most cockamamie load of hooey that ever came down the Christian pike. And I'll tell you one thing. I can perfectly understand why the Apostle Paul prayed day and night in tears for the soon coming falling away that would take place that would culminate the rise in the rise and the manifestation in the world of the man of sin. This apostasy took place just as Paul predicted. It was taking place before he ever died. He saw it with his own two eyes. The mystery of iniquity doth already work, he said. And it culminated and manifested itself in the world as the Roman papacy. There you have the truth, the truth that was known 500 years ago. There's nothing special about me. There's nothing special about Yerk. But God has given us wisdom and knowledge that was common 500 years ago. And I want to share it with anybody that will listen. Back to you, Yerk. It's interesting, Tom, that the title of our series, The Roman Catholic Socialist Agenda, answers the question that Robert Schuller asked. When he asks the Pope, what do we have to do to come home? The Pope answers, caritas in veritate. Yeah. We'll adopt Roman Catholic social order. That is a global 
commune. Give me everything, everything you have because it was mine from the very beginning. And since I am not the Antichrist, as you through economism and futurism now know and profess and shout out everywhere, give me everything you ever took from me. That's give right. it to me. The, rep the reparations that are now being exacted by the papacy is this global you, everything, commonality, everything shared in common. That's the reparations the Protestants and evangelicals are made. We have no more private property. Oh, you can call it yours. You can park your car in your driveway. You can put it in your garage. But if somebody comes along that has need and you have two cars, they can take your car. If you, wa if you walk away from your house and go on vacation for two weeks and you come home and somebody else is living in your house, you can't kick them out because they who moved in have need. Everything is owned in common. Everything is shared in common. This is for the common good. He that hath must give to the poor whenever he wants it. That's the reparations that Protestants... See, this is what we get for believing in futurism. We're paying the piper now. We, we healed the deadly wound of the papacy that was inflicted at the time of the Protestant Reformation. Now he's alive and well again, and he wants exaction from us, and we're going to have to give with our blood, our sweat, and our tears, and our property. You don't own your house. You don't own your car. You can call it yours. You can say you own it. You can even produce a deed or a title. But if somebody else wants it and says they need it, they own it. You take and take it from you. You can't understand Klaus Schwab, who says you shall own nothing and you will be happy. You can't understand that kind of cockamamie load of BS unless you understand that we're making reparation to the Pope. And Klaus Schwab is one of these that are implementing this papal common uh, socialism. Okay, now for the first time in your life, if, if the bells start ringing in your head and you begin to understand some of this stuff, now you can understand what they're talking about when they turn on the television. Now you can understand some of the cockamamie baloney that you read in the newspapers. This is papal domination taking place all over the world. And you say, oh, Tom, the papacy just doesn't have that much power. It doesn't have that much influence. Well, you're, you're completely ignorant of history if you believe that. The papacy has always had this power in the world, has exercised his power as king of kings and lord of lords. It was only suspended at the time of the Protestant Reformation. Now the Protestants are saying, oh, we made a big mistake. We're sorry. We're coming back home and we're going to make reparations. Papacy says, you damn well right going to make reparations. And here it is. Roman Catholic social order. I own everything. I'm the king of this world and I own this world and all that's in it. The earth is mine and the fullness thereof, just as if I were Christ on earth. And I'm going to redistribute the world's wealth. I'm going to do it right in front of your face. And you're going to blame your politicians or anybody else. You'll never consider that it was me who did it. And it was, it was the Protestants who brought it about. You know, the Protestants and the evangelicals were the ones that put the Band-Aid on the wound and nursed the papacy back to health to be a global dictator like he started out being 500 years ago. Uh, well, 2,000 years ago. The deadly wounds healed because the Protestants have reneged on their, on their belief in Christ and now ready to unite with the Antichrist, just like Robert Schuller said. It's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd, that is, the Pope, and say, quote, what do we have to do to come home? The answer is, you have to surrender everything you own. Just like Jesus said to the rich man, you, you, you say you've, you've, you've kept the commandments all your life, now sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Well, that's what we're all going to do. That's what he we're going to be forced to do it, and we get to call it charity. Okay? But you know what God calls it? Theft. Thou shalt not steal. 
The whole world is in apostasy. The whole world will not believe what is really happening in this world. And uh, they have no eyes to see or ears to hear until somebody opens their eyes and opens their ears like God did to me and like God did to Yerk. It can happen for you, but you have to be willing. Back to you, Yerk. I would like to use an example on how the Roman papacy um, slips this agenda of you own nothing and you will be happy into our daily lives and many people are even happy about it. Yeah. I, I, I will use a few examples and I, I don't know if you know them, Tom, <laughs> otherwise it would be news to you too, but I think you've heard about that. Uh, ever since these electric vehicles came up a few years ago with Tesla, now every big car company builds electrical vehicles, which don't only have an electrical engine, means they don't use a combustion engine of any shape or form anymore, but just an electric engine, but they are actually driving computers. It's not a car with a computer, it's a computer with wheels. <laughs> That's how Elon Musk, this uh, high Freemason, likes to talk about his Tesla company. The point is the following. Mercedes, uh, everybody of you knows Mercedes-Benz, right? The inventor of the car. Huh? Um, Mercedes-Benz uh, brought out their new models with um, all-wheel uh, steering possibility. And you have that all-wheel steering possibility, the, the back wheels steer with the uh, front wheels uh, in the other direction, but that helps the uh, steering uh, and the control of the car, 3%. It only turns, the wheels only turn 3%. You have the possibility also to have a full uh, grip on the, uh, on, the, on the steering of the rear wheels. And then they are using 11% or something in that regard. I'm not that car of a, kind of a car expert anyway. But the point is, you get 3% free when you order this uh, surplus on your, uh, on your naked car. You know, you always have these extras that you can order. That's an extra that you can order. You get 3%. And then you can rent the 11%. So that means you own the car, but the function of full wheel, full four wheel steering, you can rent. And BMW came out and now rents a heated steering wheel. Some people just like it when they go into their car and their steering wheel is heated. Well, the function is there, but only when you rent it, you can get the function applied. And people love it. The Chinese auto const uh, car constructor Neo rents the battery. Renault, which is part of, uh, no, which is not part of Stellantis. Stellantis is the other company. Renault, which is a French company of cars, brought out years ago the Zoe, which is a small little car, fully electric. But you don't own the battery. You rent the battery. So that means that you buy a part and you rent another. And people love it. But what you rent, you don't own. And you don't pay the rent, you don't have the function anymore. This is how they slowly but continuously get you driving into this idea of using something, but not owning it. Remember, we are just in the beginning of 2024. We are not yet in 2030. But this will go on in steps. First, baby steps. And after that, giant steps. There was a European commissioner. I, I, don't, I don't know what function he actually had in the European, uh, European Parliament or something anymore. Uh, he was a former uh, prime minister of Luxembourg. And he said, we in the EU, we have our plans and we go two steps forward. We're not go back. We go two steps forward. And if nothing happens, well, wonderful. We go again two steps forward. And if then there comes a great yelling, oh, you can do this. Okay, we get one step back. 
And then again, we go two steps forward. So when you always go two steps forward and maximum one step back, where are you going? Well, Tom said it wonderfully in this video on the grandfather clock. <laughs> the pendulum doesn't advance. But the pendulum that only swings from right to left and left to right advances the finger on or the the uh, yeah the, the finger or what you, the pointer on, on on the clock right that's the agenda that advances and when you go always two steps forward and maximum one step back you will always get forward so now we are 2024 and these few examples are only a few examples that i know of there are many pro probably even many more examples that you can think of that things that are rented now you don't own anymore and people love it and people go along with that idea i don't know why i would never go along with that idea but they go along with that idea and that's just the first step in that direction oh that's just a, not the first step let me correct that it's not the first step in that direction it's just another step in that direction and you will see where it's going to when you understand caritas and veritata when you understand the roman catholic socialist agenda So the question from Robert Schuler at the beginning of page 452 to the wolf in sheep's clothing, what do we have to do to come home, is giving you the answer with the subject of this whole series, the Roman Catholic Socialist Agenda. That's what you have to do to come home. Surrender everything that you ever achieved by reading the Bible and understand freedom and understand Jesus Christ and accepting the peace that he gives, not the peace the world gives, but the peace he gives. The truth that Jesus Christ gives, not the truth the world gives, but the truth that Jesus Christ gives. Give all that up and you're back in the dungeon and you will be led into the pit. Exactly like Lucifer in Isaiah Chapter 14, verse 15. Some final thoughts, Tom? No, I, I, uh, I, I think that people ought to be able to understand plain English. This is, <laughs> yeah, this, this, this is the papal system. This is the Antichrist system. This is what we brought upon ourselves when we abandoned the truth that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. We've abandoned that. Now we believe in a future Antichrist, a single individual, and now we're paying the piper, the piper in Rome, the Antichrist, the papacy, and our governments are his agents. They are the ones who impose upon us his laws. That's their function. Now, I just want to remind the listeners, when, when Jesus was baptized, he came out of the water, and he went into the desert to be tempted of Satan. And Satan said to Jesus, among other things, he said, see all the kingdoms of this world and the glory of them all. To you I will give them if you'll just bow down and worship me. Now Jesus refused that offer, but what was Satan offering him? The position of King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What are the nations of this world and the glory of them all? That's the governments of all the nations. To you I will give them. That is global government. If you'll just bow down and worship me. You will be king of kings and lord of lords. There will be no nation that's not under your power. And the wealth of all the nations will be yours if you'll just bow down and worship me. Whatever you say will be enforced by the governments of the world because you will be king of kings and lord of lords in this world if you'll just bow down and worship me. Now, we all know that Jesus rejected that offer. But the papacy accepted it. He is the God of this world. 
He is the vicar of Satan. He sits in the place of Christ on earth, and the governments of the world do what he says or else. They can be JFK'd at high noon with the cameras rolling, and no one will go to jail. That's the new world order. That's what Satan offered Jesus. Jesus rejected it, but the man of sin accepted it. It is, was, and always will be the papacy. And if you want to know why your government is oppressing you, it's because they don't rule at your behest. They don't follow your instruction. They don't respond to your needs or wants or desires. They respond to the will of the one who rules over them, the man of sin in Rome. And if you doubt a word I've said, all you've got to do is go to Google Images and type in the name of the Pope and the kings of this world, and all before your very eyes will unfold page after page after page of images of every king in this world on his knees before the Pope, kissing his ring, wearing black and veils in submission to his authority. You don't have to take my word for it. See it for yourself with your own eyes. It, the papacy has more power today, by far more power today, than he ever had in the history of the world, simply because the Protestants reneged on the truth. They forgot the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, and they believed a Jesuit pipe dream called futurism, that the Pope's not the Antichrist, he's a single individual that isn't in the world yet, that comes just before Christ returns. And by the way, you'll probably be raptured out before he comes anyway, so you really don't have anything to worry about. What you got to do is obey the Pope. He's the head of the Christian world. You got to unite with him, and you got to give the unity that Christ prayed to his Father for. That's the solution for you. So you can eat and drink damnation to yourself so you can worship and obey the man of sin in Rome. That's what they've got scheduled for you. That's what Charles Schwab is all about. That's what your governments are all about. That's what your bankers are all about. That's what your doctor is all about. That's what your city council is all about because they're ruled over by the local bishop, an emissary of the Pope. The world is corrupt. It's because Protestants lost their way. And I'd like to restore it. God help me. Back to you.